Marc Merger is making history as the world's first functioning cyborg. Part man, part machine. This guy sells skulls for a living. See how he uses an army of insects to strip every bit of flesh off the bone. The Beatles excite me. He can blow a dart nearly 130 miles an hour with pinpoint accuracy. Now he'll attempt a feat many consider impossible. Plus, this guy's using his face to catch a flaming bowling ball stuffed with steak knives. And check out the books unfolding into an amazing collection of novel designer dresses. Unbelievable? Believe it. On Ripley's Believe It or Not. Welcome to Ripley's Believe It or Not. Tonight, we begin with a Ripley's exclusive from a science lab in Strasbourg, France. That's where a computer chip like this is responsible for a first and unbelievable step that has turned science fiction into medical fact. Marc Merger is a man about to make history. In this never before seen footage, he'll pioneer the very future of mankind, walking first time in 11 years. Believe it or not, he's the world's first functioning cyborg. Part man, part machine. Je redécouvre que j'ai toujours des jambes et encore mieux que ça, c'est qu'elles peuvent me servir à me mettre debout et à avancer. Mark severed his spinal cord in a violent car accident in 1989, an accident he was lucky to survive. It was tough, but Mark adjusted to life as a paraplegic, eventually even raising a family. But Mark's life would soon change in ways no one would have expected. For the past two decades, a talented team of medical researchers based in France have been working on a radical new cure for spinal cord injuries. The team was headed up by a true visionary, Dr. Pierre Habichon. The goal was for more than 20 years to try to restore locomotion in paralyzed persons. The team was now ready to test their work. Mark's severe spinal injuries qualified him as the ideal candidate. The muscles in his legs would still work if there were just a way to reconnect them to his brain. In a remarkably complex 14-hour operation, an electronic microchip containing more than 50,000 transistors is implanted into Mark's abdomen. From there, a dozen electrodes are directly wired from the implant to muscle nerve fibers in Mark's legs. After recuperating from the operation, Mark and his physiotherapist go to work. This revolutionary computer program is actually telling Mark's muscles how to move. Once Mark gives the okay, the technician sends an electrical signal through this handheld transmitter, a signal that then travels into the microchip implanted in Mark's stomach. Amazingly, that in turn controls the leg muscles. It's so incredibly complex that in the beginning, progress is slow. Complicating matters, Mark's muscles have been degenerating for more than 10 years. But before he could try walking, Mark first had to learn how to stand. After months of trial and error, it was time to test the idea. At the official press conference unveiling the new technology, Mark attempts to stand on his own two feet. Incredibly, it's the first time in 11 years. La première fois que je me suis mis debout, c'était une sensation assez fabuleuse. Je me suis dit, ouf, ça marche. After intensive therapy, Mark is finally able to stand for 30 minutes. The medical team now agrees. It's time for him to try walking. Once more, the computer helps Mark to stand. Then he gives the technician the command to begin. The steps are small, but for the first time in 11 years, 
Mark is walking again. And with computers constantly getting smaller, Mark's first steps represent a bionic future where robotic and human parts are one. Ce que j'ai remarqué est qu'en fait, plus je m'en sers, plus c'est facile. Of course, it's not finished. It's just the beginning of something. We can improve the quality of life of the patient. That is for me the best thing. Surprisingly, the leader in this kind of computer chip technology is not America's Silicon Valley, but France. This is a blowgun used by primitive tribes around the world. This particular one comes from the Philippines. Blowguns were and still are used for hunting animals, but they were also used to hunt people in times of war. Michael Janich has revived the lost art of dart blowing. But don't worry, he only shoots targets, not people. Ooh. Everyone knows Michael Janich is a real blowhard. In fact, he blows so hard and so accurately that today for Ripley's, using just his breath, he'll send a dart through this tube and attempt to hit a grapefruit 75 feet away. That's further than the length of a bowling alley. Michael is a leading expert and master of one of the world's most ancient weapons, the blowgun. The blowgun is uh, the forefather of all firearms. To catch this blowgun specialist at work, Ripley's needed a high-speed camera just to follow the action. These darts move at an incredible 190 feet per second. That's 129 miles an hour. And they hit hard, easily penetrating this 3 8 inch piece of plywood. Michael's fascination with these primitive yet effective weapons began when he was young. I got interested in blowguns when I was a kid because uh, I always saw ads for blowguns in the back of outdoor magazines. Something about the blowgun's basic design caught Michael's eye. Just the fact that something so simple could be so powerful. Uh, just harnessing the human breath could propel a projectile uh, much the same way that you'd have with a, with a rifle or a handgun. Over the years, Michael has studied and collected everything he could find on blowguns. And he's even written his own book on the history of the subject called Blowguns, The Breath of Death. The heart of blowgun use today uh, would be in the Amazon basin in Ecuador, uh, among the uh, Warani Indians and some of the other primitive tribes that still exist there. Michael's home, located in the foothills of Colorado's Rocky Mountains, houses Michael's collection of more than 40 traditional and modern blowguns. On one end, you've got something like this. This is a traditional blowgun, a Sumpitan from Malaysia, and these are still in use in Malaysia today. On the other end of the scale, you've got the high-tech approach. This one actually has a laser attached to it. Michael's amazing ability with a blowgun is so remarkable because his guns are so low-tech. Breath control is inexact, and unlike rifles, blowguns don't have sights. There have been many attempts to put sights on blowguns, but basically it doesn't work because unless you're horribly disfigured, your mouth is going to be off-center from your eye. But after so many years, Michael makes it look deceptively easy. It's practice, and a lot of it just feel. But to hit the grapefruit target set up 75 feet away, it will take a lot of air. You want it to be an explosive breath. Michael sets up, takes aim, and with one mighty burst of breath, he nails his grapefruit target. And he does it again and again. But it's not just the distance that the master takes pride in, it's his accuracy. A lot of times when you shoot a dart and you know you got it right, you feel it immediately. Blowguns are banned in California and Massachusetts. Next, step inside the most ghoulish gallery ever. You'll never forget the things you see inside the world's scariest museum. Plus, the one-of-a-kind race that's got this cow training on a treadmill. And they risk getting their fingers snapped off feeding these vicious fish by hand. Now, one diver will risk getting his face mangled, feeding them right out of his mouth. It's all ahead on Ripley's.
enter Robert Ripley's archives. Let's go to the show. Robin Ripley, David or not. Believe it or not. The year is 1933. With the automobile taking over America's roadways, parking has become a major problem. One inventor attempts to solve the parking predicament with a simple solution, adding a fifth wheel. By aiming the extra wheel sideways, an average-sized car can squeeze into the smallest of spaces. Unfortunately, this useful innovation never catches on, forcing millions of future drivers to take the dreaded parallel parking test. Believe it or not, There are horse races, dog races, and of course, people race all the time. This makes sense. But cow racing? <laughs> Come on. Michigan State University has a long-standing reputation for churning out world-class athletes. But now, their latest protege is really beefing up that image. Believe it or not, you're looking at the winner of the first cow race in history. And today, Taffy and her trainer will try to defend their undefeated title. I took cow racing pretty seriously. Meet Brian Nielsen, MSU professor, racehorse trainer, and cow jockey. Yep. Brian first discovered Taffy when she was part of a university research experiment testing the effects of exercise on dairy cows. She actually is a cow that likes to exercise. But it wasn't until Pete and Barb Andres came up with the idea for cow racing that Brian was able to demonstrate Taffy's amazing athletic ability. The local fairs were having a hard time getting attendance. What? So my thing was to have a cow race to have more people come to the fair. Despite her strict exercise regimen on a treadmill designed for racehorses, Taffy still needed more conditioning to become a star athlete. Regular milking by coach and calf alike helped to lighten her load. The small udder sure helps in that it doesn't go swinging back from side to side. and It keeps out of the way and we're able to get a lot more speed and probably helps with aerodynamics too. In no time, Taffy became... A lean, mean running machine? You better believe it. The duo's efforts paid off. Taffy and Brian went on to win the world's first cow race. She knows she's good. She definitely has an attitude. But a champion shouldn't rest on her laurels. So Ripley's went along as Taffy prepared to defend her title at Mount Pleasant Racetrack. I think this is my one opportunity to be totally undefeated and hopefully Taffy and I will retire as reigning champions. Brian and Taffy will be competing against six other cows and riders, each with a range of tactics and philosophies. If you should show them love, they'll show you love. She's raced before twice, and she's bucked both times. I, I really don't like come off, because uh, usually they kind of want to hunt you up and stomp you in the ground. The race begins. <laughs> Less than a minute into the competition, one cow steers off course. <laughs> Taffy and Brian quickly take a definitive lead. The professor's students cheer him on. I, I'm pretty sure that Taffy's just thinking, let's go, let's go. I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm riding a cow. <laughs> Just like a racehorse jockey with riding crop in hand, Brian spurs Taffy on to victory. Crossing the finish line in style, Brian retires undefeated in cow racing and says Taffy's running days are over too. Taffy doesn't have to do any other work. Uh, like a lot of really high talented racehorses, she gets in, go into retirement and kind of live a cush life. Brian Nielsen was so happy about winning the race, he proposed marriage to his girlfriend right there in the winner's circle. Now you're about to meet J.D. and Kathy, a happily married couple.